The Sibylline Oracles, texts written in Greek hexameter prose, are a wide-ranging phenomena that is said to stretch back to the Oracle of Delphi and spread throughout the Hellenistic world into Asia Minor, Mesopotamia, Judea, North Africa, and Italy. The Sibyl was at first depicted as an aged woman with the gift of prophecy, and that there were 12 of them, the Persian Sibyl, the Libyan Sibyl, Delphic Sibyl, Cimmerian, Erythrian, Samian, Cumaean, Hellespontine, Phrygian, Turbatine, Egyptian, and Chaldean Sibyl. Some lists replace the Persian Sibyl with the Hebrew Sibyl. Legend had it that the Cumaean Sibyl, close to Rome, was a thousand years old and had given her books to the fifth king of Rome, an Etruscan king named Tarquinius Priscus, grandson of Numa Populus, who succeeded Romulus. These oracles were entrusted to the priesthood of Jupiter to be guarded by the Vestal Virgins and only consulted in times of crisis. Regardless of the truth of their origins, these books became central to the religion of Rome during the Republic era. Like the prophets of the Old Testament, these sibyls predicted future catastrophic events and the demise of major cities by God. These texts were most likely used as a form of political propaganda to sway public opinion during times of war. From the 3rd century BC to the 1st century, we see a mixture of Greek and Jewish themes present in these texts, specifically in Alexandria, Egypt, where a large Jewish and Greek population coexist. It is here in Alexandria where the collection of all 12 sibyls are gathered and put into one collection. They show both Jewish and pagan influence, everything from Hesiod themes of the golden age of Saturn, Homeric epics like the Iliad, predictions of Romulus, Cyrus the Great, Alexander the Great, Caesar Augustus, as well as references to gods like Ares, Kronos, Aphrodite, Zeus, and the Titans vs. the Olympians, all the way to stories about Noah's Ark, the Tower of Babel, Moses getting the tablets on Mount Sinai, the Latin poet Virgil is mentioned by name in the Sibylline Oracles as a great teacher sent by God to teach the world, and Virgil himself cites the Sibylline books in his Aeneid and mentions Dephobi as the Cumaean Sibyl. To show some passages of the third Sibylline Oracle to give you an idea of what it's like. But he, eternal Lord, proclaims himself as one who is, and was, and shall be, to hear the only name of heaven's great God, the ruler of the world. He, by his Logos, created all things, even Aranos and Thassala, and tireless Helios, and full Selene and bright Astraeus, and mighty mother Tethys, springs and rivers, imperishable fire, and Himera and Nyx. This is the God who formed four-letter Adam, the first one formed and filling with his name Anatoly, Hesperides, Notos, and Boreas. The same is he who fixed the pattern of the human form and made wild beasts and creeping things and fowls. Sibylline Oracles 3 Notice the blend between pagan and Jewish elements and how the Creator includes the many gods within his creation of the world. This type of genre can also be seen along the book of Revelation, for example. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. Gaia and Aranos fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they have done, as recorded in the books. Thassala gave up the dead that were in it, and Thanatos and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then Thanatos and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. 
the lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation. If you read the English translation, you might not know this, but most English translations are like playing a game of telephone, being filtered through Latin and different versions of English. The nouns are translated into places when they are written as names. Not only that, Gaia, Aranos, Thassala, Thanatos, and Hades are all gods that have hymns dedicated to them in the Orphic hymns. The latter three, Thassala, Thanatos, and Hades, are gods who rule over the dead, while Gaia and Aranos rule over creation. Their functions in this book, Revelation, chapter 20, are exactly this, seeing Gaia and Aranos fleeing from God, and Thanatos, Hades, and Thassala giving up their dead. Here, Thanatos and Hades are being judged and casted into the lake of fire for being insubordinate to the divine plan of God. Revelation was the last book to be accepted into the Christian biblical canon, and even at present day, some Nestorian churches reject it. It was tainted because the heretical sect of the Montanists relied on it, and doubts were raised over its Jewishness and authorship, and it was not until 419 that it was included into the canon. The Montanists were led by Montanus, a heretic who was also called a Gnostic, and he was a Sibyllist. He was assisted by two women, Prisca and Maximilla, who led a Christian Sibyllist group called the Illuminati, Enlightened Ones. Yeah, Illuminati. And these women were considered prophetesses and the voices of the Sibyl. They entered into states of ecstatic frenzies, spoke in tongues, and prophesied the future. Montanus, despite being deemed a heretic, is credited with baptizing Tertullian, who is also known as the father of Latin Christianity. Already we're starting to see that the lines between heretics and orthodoxy are getting blurred. If you think that's a lot, just keep watching. The Sibyl continues. But when Rome shall o'er Egypt also rule, governing always, then shall there appear the greatest kingdom of the immortal king over men, and a holy lord shall come to hold the scepter over every land, unto all ages of fast hastening time. From the Sebastinis line of Augustus, Belair Nero shall come. Hereafter the height of hills shall he establish and shall make the sea stand still, and the great fiery sun and bright moon, and he shall raise the dead and many signs work before men, but nothing shall be brought by him unto completion but deceit, and many mortals shall be led astray, Hebrews both true and choice, and lawless men, Sibylline Oracles 3. Here we see another theme that both the Sibyl and the Revelation have in common, prophecy of the birth of Christ under the reign of Augustus, and the coming of the Antichrist, who is Nero. Here is how it is told in Revelation. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf, and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed, and it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. Revelation. We know that the beast is Nero because the Latin version gives the Dramatria of 616, the only name in both Greek and Latin that have a Dramatria of 666 and 616 who also fits this role is Nero, the Antichrist who caused the seven-year war between Rome and Judea to break out 
that results in the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem. The Sibyl continues. And then the generation tenth appeared of mortal men, from the time when the flood came upon earlier men. And Kronos reigned, and Titan, and Iapetus, and men called them best, offspring of Gaia and of Uranus, giving them names both of earth and heaven, since they were very first of mortal men. So there were three divisions of the earth, according to the allotment of each man, and each one having his own portion reigned, and fought not, for father's oath were there, and equal were their portions. But the time, complete of old age, on the father came, and he died, and the sons, infringing oaths, stirred up against each other bitter strife, which one should have the royal rank and rule over all mortals, and against each other. Kronos and Titan fought, but Rhea and Gaia and Aphrodite fond of crowns, Demeter and Hestia and Dione of fair locks brought them to friendship and together called. All who were kings, both brothers and near kin, and others of the same ancestral blood. But when the Titans heard that there were sons kept secretly, whom Kronos and his wife Rhea begat, then Titan sixty youths and this is the beginning of dire war, the Egyptian kingdom, then that of the Persians, and of the Medes, and Ethiopians, and of Assyria and Babylon, and then that of the Macedonians, Egyptian yet again, then that of Rome, God imparted first, bow many kingdoms have been together, gathered of mankind. For first of all, the house of Solomon shall include horsemen of Phoenicia and Syria, and of the islands too, Sibylline Oracles 3. Once again, we see themes from Hesiod of the Golden Age and the war breaking out in heaven between Titans and Olympians, but it quickly evolves into themes found in Daniel with the succession of kingdoms of the Assyrians, Persians, Greeks, and Romans. Finally, we are told about the house of Solomon as God's kingdom on earth. The Sibyl ends with this. These things I show thee, the long walls of Assyrian Babylon, for Greece to proclaim to all the wrath of God, fire sent, and that I might to mortals prophesy of mysteries divine. And men shall say in Greece that I am a foreign land of Ethre born shameless. Others say that I am a Sibyl born of mother Circe and father Nostos. Sibylline Oracles 3. Circe is the sister of Medea and the daughter of Hecate, goddess of magic, who is in Homer's Odyssey and other Greek and Roman myths, and she says her father is Nostos, an obvious Gnostic reference to the father of knowing. This is just one tiny section of hundreds of pages and dozens of oracles written by pagans, Jews, and Christians living in Alexandria from 300 BC all the way until the 15th century, when they are strictly written by only Orthodox Christians. They end up being used as political propaganda by the Byzantines against the Muslims, when they repurpose the Antichrist to be Muhammad. But the origins of these very Orthodox Christian Sibylline oracles go back before Christianity even existed, during a time when the Orphics, Platonists, Pythagoreans, and Jews clashed in Alexandria, especially during the second century BCE. It is during this time in Alexandria where Daniel and Enoch are written, texts that show close proximity to the Sibylline tradition about dreamlike oracles of future events and messianic promises. Orpheus was credited by both Jews and Greeks in Alexandria as being a great theologian who fathered Moses and was a son of the Sibyl. They also claim that Noah's daughter was the Erythrian Sibyl, called Thea Sibyl, the goddess Sibyl. And Heraclitus, in the 6th century BC, said that her voice reaches through thousands of years. It is in this mixed cultural environment of Alexandria where we get people like Aristobulus and Philo, and the soil for Christianity to thrive in is laid down. It is not a mistake that Celsus calls Christians Sibylists. 
he is right on the money with this. These oracles, which started off as Greek, then Roman, then Jewish, and then towards the end of the first century and second century, were Christian and only written by Christians. These Sibylline oracles are cited by Josephus, Justin Martyr, Clement, and Origen, and play a crucial role in the early church. 